It's evening at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, and a single F-111 of the United States Tactical Air Command prepares to take off. The crew, both highly experienced, each with over 1,000 hours of flying time, go through the pre-flight ritual necessary to lift 80,000 pounds of high technology in the air and onwards to twice the speed of sound. To these airmen, it's just a matter of controls, instrument checks and radio communication. Predictable, orderly and routine. But the evolution of the F-111 was really predictable and never routine. Okay, gear coming up. This aircraft's origins go back to the late 1950s, at which time the US Air Force was divided into several major air commands. But those most involved with combat aircraft were Strategic Air Command, charged with the Intercontinental Heavy Bombing Role, Air Defense Command, responsible for aerial protection, and the Tactical Air Command, or TAC as it was known, responsible for ground attack and interdiction tasks. By 1958, Tactical Air Command was employing F-105 Thunder Chiefs built by Republic Aviation, a company which had produced aircraft for the ground attack role since World War II. The 105, with its internal bomb bay and high speed, represented a major step forward in tactical fighters. It was a thoroughly specialized aircraft designed to fill one role and fill it well. It went on to serve particularly well in the early part of the air war over Vietnam. However, the thud, as it became known, did have some inherent failings. It had a limited range, which encouraged it to be flown at altitude, thus making it vulnerable to enemy radar-aimed missiles.
Roger, Badger, take it down. Uh, we got a launch. I see them coming off the pad at 12 o'clock. I think we're all right for the time being. Okay, Detroit, uh, let's get out of here to the southwest. The Thunder Chief was also restricted to daytime bombing, often needing fighter cover. Another constraint was that it required long conventional runways. Knowing the long lead time to develop modern warplanes, as the 105 was entering service, TAC was already forming requirements for a replacement, the TFX project. TFX specifications were encouraged by advances in new materials and manufacturing techniques. Solid state electronic technology Turbo fan engines utilizing afterburners for extra power. But most exciting of all, information received from NASA confirmed that new approaches to using a variable swing wing were practical and would give far greater flexibility to aircraft performance. The Navy too was contemplating a new aircraft to be used as a fleet defense fighter. But while the F-4 Phantom was to be an exception, for reasons of specialized needs, the two services always developed their own aircraft. A trend that possibly would have continued were it not for the appointment in 1961 of Secretary for Defense McNamara. Robert McNamara was nothing if not a pragmatist. A former vice president of the Ford Motor Company he arrived at the Pentagon determined to dispose of bureaucratic duplication and waste, only to be confronted with the Air Force's TFX and the Navy's fighter aircraft requirements. Despite strong objections from both Air Force and Navy staff, McNamara insisted on a policy of commonality, and submissions were called for from the industry for one basic design suitable for use in both services. In January 1962, after several competitions, the Pentagon reduced the field to two possible alternatives. Boeing's 818 model, while favored by both services, did not have a sufficiently high commonality content and would have employed engines that at the time were still on the drawing board. The other alternative was a joint venture from General Dynamics as the principal contractor supported by the Grumman Corporation. Their design did offer a very high level of common ingredients for both services. In fact, the only major components to differ were the undercarriage, the wing length, and the nose. These are mock-ups of the two different nose designs. And in diagram form, firstly, the Navy's B design, followed by the Air Force A model. Overall, the General Dynamics design impressed McNamara the most, and their adherence to his commonality guidelines contributed to an initial order being placed in November 62 for 18 Air Force and 5 Navy planes. F-111s were produced at the Fort Worth plant of General Dynamics Convair Division, where the main building is a staggering one mile long.
The first pre-production model was officially rolled out 16 days ahead of schedule. Twenty-five months after the contract was signed, the first F-111, an Air Force version, took to the air. Typically, the F-111's design embraced many features, some used for the very first time on any aircraft anywhere. One of these was a crew capsule that could be jettisoned in an emergency as a complete unit clear of the main fuselage by the use of rockets. This could be done at any speed, at any altitude, or even from below water and after it has landed or surfaced, the capsule could act as a survival shelter. The F-111 was the first aircraft to go into full production utilizing after-burning turbofan engines. The TF-30 gave considerable economy and thus greater range and the afterburners were available for takeoff and extra speed. Still more range was built into the general dynamics design by utilizing every possible area available for fuel storage. Even without external wing tanks, the plane had a range of over 2,500 nautical miles. But with flight refueling or external tanks, targets anywhere were within its range. When no external fuel was carried, all of the wing points were free to lift an enormous array of ordnance, and this on top of the considerable internal bomb bay load. One-elevens can carry almost any weapon in the U.S. Air Force arsenal, from the M61 Vulcan cannon to a free-falling nuclear bomb. As an added defense, 
both foil, an electronic countermeasure, and flares to confuse heat-seeking missiles can be carried on combat missions. One of the original requirements of the TFX project was that the design should allow for landing on short makeshift runways. And to enable such a heavy plane to do this, General Dynamics designed the High Flotation Variable Terrain Landing Gear. Another feature originally unique to the 111 was its terrain following radar. This system allows the pilot to select an operating height above ground of as little as 200 feet. When the control is set, the aircraft will respond to its forward terrain scanning radar and adjust its height automatically. There is also a manual mode allowing the pilot to use the same radar gathered information reproduced on a cockpit instrument display. Thus, it is possible for the aircraft to fly at night and in all weather, and still remain low enough to avoid possible radar detection. But the 111 will most certainly be remembered above all as the first production aircraft to employ variable sweep wings. The history of the swing wing really goes back to the Second World War, when Messerschmitt produced several designs and actually built the P-1101. It never flew. But much of the design was used in the American Bell X-5 built after the war. This model flew successfully, as did the Grumman Jaguar, but neither plane was developed. For high-speed flight, the 111's wing could be swept back to form a delta configuration. An intermediate position was often used for economical mid-range flight, and a full forward position was available for takeoff, landing, and low-speed flying. The plane could literally be redesigned in flight to suit the role it was to perform. Not only had the Fort Worth team to design a wing that could adjust its angle, but also within that surface, flaps, slats and fuel, together with their operating mechanisms, had to be accommodated. To enable the forward slats to function, this glove would open, and it also acted as an airfoil.
The development of the Air Force's A model continued and good progress was made as all the new technology was put through its paces. However, Grumman, who were charged with the development of the Navy's B version, were having less success with their prototypes. Given McNamara's commitment to commonality, the Navy had little choice but to accept the B version of the F-111, or at least the prototypes. The first of the prototypes used much the same parts as the A model. However, for successful carrier use, lighter planes were required. Two hideously expensive weight reduction programs did not reduce the B model by the required 20,000 pounds. And along the line, the resultant modifications had radically reduced the commonality factor. Whilst the B model was undoubtedly a beautiful aircraft, it was never destined to sea service. And in July 1968, the Navy's Total 111 program was abandoned and Grumman was allowed to continue on with its successful F-14 Tomcat. Harvest Reaper was the test program for bringing the aircraft to combat readiness. And by early 68, after eight months of testing, a decision was made to subject the F-111 to actual combat conditions then offered by the air war in Vietnam. Six aircraft from the 474 Tactical Fighter Wing were deployed from Nellis Air Force Base to Thailand. The F-111As operated from the Royal Thai Air Force Base at Tokli under a combat testing and evaluation program known as Combat Lancer. From this location, they were well within easy access of targets in Vietnam. Unfortunately, the results were not all good. Within two weeks, two planes were lost without trace. Less than a month later, another 111 went down. But this time, the crew ejected and the wreckage was found and examined. The losses received bad publicity were wrongly attributed in some news reports to ground fire when the problems were really of a technical nature. After 55 missions had been flown, the operation ended and the remaining aircraft returned to Nellis. The losses in Vietnam were traced to a failure in the mechanism of the plane's massive horizontal stabilizer. Then, in December 69, a Nellis-based 111 lost a wing, resulting in a fatal crash. All 
all-flying 111s were grounded while the program was placed under intense scrutiny. The wing problem, traced to a failure in the wing pivot box, was not the only ammunition for its critics. The expensive development in the Navy B version, considerable cost overruns and the losses in Vietnam had all caused the General Dynamics wonder plane to suffer at the hands of press and political opponents alike. In defence of the 111 project, it must be said that in trailblazing so much new technology, it was inevitable that major problems would be encountered. However, the Air Force and the company had confidence in the design, and a modification program began. During the 111's long evolution, very few external changes are noticeable. One minor one, the deletion of the moving air intake cowl and its replacement by a demand-activated inlet door, distinguishes the early A version from other models. By the time the modification program was complete, the 111 stood a near-perfect airplane. TAC used four different strike versions of the F-111. Externally, they are almost identical, but they varied considerably in cost due to the electronics packages used. Apart from TAC, the Strategic Air Command, looking for a replacement to offset the loss of its older B-52s and the B-58 Hustlers, employed 76 FB-111s as strategic bombers. SAC versions had a longer wing and a strengthened undercarriage, but were generally much the same as their tactical air command cousins. Thus, the 111, once designated a fighter, now flies alongside later B-52s as part of the US nuclear deterrent force. Although Britain had once indicated its intention to purchase 111s, the only other country to actually do so was Australia. The Royal Australian Air Force, in a brave move, ordered 24 F-111s straight off the drawing board. Unfortunately, due to the modification program, they were either in storage or being modified over a long period of time, and thus were delivered late, at greater cost. However, 
The Australian F-111Cs, with their longer wings and strengthened undercarriage, similar to the SAC bomber model, are now considered a wise choice and perform their role well. The impact on Australian pilots of their first flight in a 111 is typified by this airman's reaction. That flight was pretty exciting. As you imagine, the takeoff in my heart and my lungs and in my throat and a bit quick up my spine, but it was really exciting. I can't compare to the afterburners and away it went. It just took off and uh, it was a fantastic feeling. But by now, the merits of the 111 as a pilot's plane were well known by all who flew them. Over 300 hours in the aircraft, and I found out that it's quite a fantastic machine, and it does most of the work for you. The low-level bomb delivery capability is outstanding. You would be beneath their radar coverage and sneak in and hit your target before they ever knew you were there. It's got a lot of goodies. It's a sort of a Cadillac of the airplanes, the fighters, so-called. I can see the cracks between railroad cars on the radar. Its resolution is that good. It's a brand new system, uh, pressing the state of the art in about four or five new areas. There's no airplane we have in the inventory that has anywhere near a light capability. And it's designed to deliver a big load under extremely adverse circumstances almost anywhere in the world. Four years after their first experience of combat, the F-111 was to return to Vietnam. It was to take part in the maximum effort line backer operation, and to demonstrate its operational readiness, within 33 hours of leaving their home base at Nellis, they were in action against targets near Hanoi. This time, the results were very different. Flying alone or in pairs, planes of TAX 474 wing notched up 4,000 successful sorties in six months. Okay, Cage, you got to fly up on the left and the right. Okay, Cage coming up. Okay, going back to stand now. And I'll check out the autopilot here. Go ahead out into altitude, hold and heading nav, and engage the autopilot. Working good. 
Okay, we're coming up on our entry point in about five miles. We'll be turning right to a heading of 101. Okay, coming right here. I'll go out back and fly past on the radar altimeter. Put the left channel in TF and we'll put the right channel over to the situation. Okay. Ready to start on down back? Roger. Okay, on a TF, start down. Okay, I'm picking up the ground return now. Yeah. Let's see attitude indicator. Let's see. Okay. Coming on down the east coast, ground returns coming in, and the radar off never clicked in at 5,000. Roger, we should level off about 500. Okay. Get down to 1,000 here now, coming up 700, 600. And it's leveling off real fine, 500. Okay, that's good. Okay. I've got a ridge coming up at 5 miles on the scope, and it's dead again. Going to 5015. Okay. Looks like it's about three miles on my east scope now. Right. Okay, we should be passing about 10 seconds. Okay, I'm going to target. And we're in target, and I'm picking up uh, picking up returns. It looks good. Crosshairs are falling good. You got the captain's car. In the whole operation, only six aircraft were lost, giving the 111 the best survival ratio of any combat aircraft in that theater. By the time they returned, criticism of the 111 was silenced forever. Later support for the wisdom of a variable wing strike bomber came from the Soviet Union by way of imitation with its Su-24 fencer very much a look-alike to the 111. Two major modifications have dramatically increased the 111's potential. One was undertaken by Grumman, GD's original partner responsible for the Navy's B model. Now with the EF-111 Raven project, they were to enjoy considerably more success. The Raven is literally an earlier model 111, stripped down to its basic components and completely rebuilt as a vehicle to carry electronic countermeasures. In these aircraft, the second crew member is an electronic weapons operator who uses the complicated electronic countermeasures to disrupt enemy radar, thus providing a curtain for other attacking aircraft. The Raven can be used in three basic ways. Firstly, in a standoff jamming role, providing protection for other aircraft from a distance. Secondly, as close air support going in at low level to give ground attack aircraft electronic cover. And finally, EF-111's deep penetration of hostile airspace along with an attacking force to jam enemy radar. Another major modification fitted to the F-111F is PaveTac, a self-contained standoff weapons delivery system using an infrared TV camera coupled to a laser rangefinder designator to place guided bombs or missiles on target.
PaveTech components are fitted at locations throughout the aircraft. A major component is the PaveTech pod, which is fitted on a rotating cradle in the bomb bay and is retracted into the bay when not in use. The PaveTech pod is equipped with electro-optical sensors, infrared TV camera and laser in a movable pod head to provide complete lower hemispherical coverage. The target is tracked on radar and steering corrections are made. Then at approximately three miles, the target is identified on the TV display and the infrared imagery is switched on. This photo-like video permits tracking of the target more accurately. The laser-guided bomb is released and the aircraft turns away to avoid the defended target and bomb blast. The forward-looking infrared continues to track the target and point the laser. Five seconds before impact, the laser is activated to guide the weapon. Here you are looking at an actual AGM Maverick missile launch. The missile crosshairs are being placed on the target by the weapons systems officer. The missile is now locked on. When it is launched, the TV video will disappear and the PaveTac infrared video will be used to aim, track and determine the effectiveness of the weapon. In 1972, F-111s were also based in Britain, where they formed part of the United States contribution to NATO. This is a D model of 27 TAC wing, and if you look closely, you will see the double C on the tail, noting that this plane was previously stationed at Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico. Here it is being winched into its hardened aircraft shelter. Now EF Ravens are also based in Britain. These crews are going through a briefing and pre-flight for one of many training missions. When not participating in exercises, there are always F-111 aircraft on standby. On April 14, 1986, F-111s of the 48th Tactical Fighter Wing left RAF Lake and Heath, not for an exercise, but as part of the American strike mission against Libya. In 
it was decided that to achieve maximum impact, five terrorist-associated military targets should be hit. They were shown on the right two targets near Benghazi and on the left three close to Tripoli. Two carriers just off the Libyan coast would use F-14s and F-18s for fighter protection and to attack enemy radar. A6s and A7s would combine as a bomber and electronic countermeasure force. And an E2C would control the entire operation, which would also require F-111s based in Britain to attack the targets in Tripoli. The most direct route for the 111s was over France or Spain, but permission was denied by both countries. The alternative was to take the long way around, flying to the Mediterranean via Gibraltar, this would require considerable in-flight refueling. All told, no less than 28 tankers would be needed to service the attack force of 18 F-111s and three Ravens. The tankers leaving from their bases at Milden Hall and Fairford were the first to go. In the early evening, they would wait for the F-111s from Lakenheath and Ravens from Upper Hayford to rendezvous. At this point, the extra aircraft provided as a safeguard against malfunction returned to base, leaving the remaining 18 F-111s with their Raven escorts to continue on into the long night ahead. Twice over the Atlantic and twice over the Mediterranean, tankers refueled the 111s on the way to their targets. At about 1.45 a.m. local time, the force dropped to about 300 feet and broke into three groups, each with its electronic escorts. One group went inland over Libya to enable it to attack Tripoli from the south. Ten minutes later, the bombers lowered their paved tack pods and began to scan for their targets. By 2 a.m., they found them. Here, an aircraft identifies its target, a military compound which is next to the tent of the Libyan leader, Colonel Gaddafi. You can actually see the tent posts through the dark of the night. Within minutes, Libyan ground defences, though denied the use of their radar, opened up with anti-aircraft fire and the night air was alive with tracers and decoy flares from the 111s. It was possibly a hit from ground fire that brought down the only aircraft lost in the raid. It crashed into the sea somewhere close to this point. There were no survivors. Whilst another group was attacking a port facility, this group attacked the military section of Tripoli Airport. You can see nine bombs, 60 feet apart, about to hit Russian-built transports. The picture flips as the plane passes over its targets. The film is shown here again, with the picture turned right side up. 
In just 11 minutes, the raid was completed and the 111s returned to their waiting tankers to be refueled twice on the return trip. But a malfunction in one aircraft caused it to land at Rota in Spain, shown here as a white spot. Fifteen hours after they'd taken off, the 111s landed back at their bases in the UK. Despite the loss of one aircraft, the raid was considered a major success for the US Combined Forces. McNamara's dream of a fighter bomber for Air Force and Navy use never came true. There can be no doubt that the F-111 project has produced an extremely effective aircraft for tactical and strategic bombing and more recently airborne electronic warfare. Its second involvement in Vietnam and the Libyan raid particularly demonstrated that this superb aircraft with its swing wing for low-level penetration and massive weapons load has more than vindicated the original production design. 